Well, hello again. Welcome to our class, uh, Leviticus for Beginners, uh, Training in Holiness. I'm uh, your teacher for this series, Mike Mazzalongo, BibleTalk.tv. This is uh, lesson number nine, entitled A Consecrated Priesthood. And this is part two. I told you there was lots of information in the book of Leviticus about the consecration of the uh, priest. Well, uh, chapter 10 closes out the first uh, section of Leviticus, where the, uh, the manner and the regulations uh, concerning the priestly duties of offering sacrifices for themselves, first of all, and then for the people, uh, are, are explained in uh, chapters uh, one to seven. Then in chapters eight, nine, and 10, God provides the process in which the priests were consecrated and ordained into ministry on behalf of the people. Uh, in the book of Exodus, we read about the building of uh, the tabernacle and the, uh, the, the making of the priestly clothes. And then uh, in Leviticus, we learned about the sacrificial system, what had to be done, uh, the procedures that had to be followed, all given by God to uh, Moses, who gave them to, uh, to Aaron. And then uh, there was the consecration of the priesthood, uh, the priesthood uh, to get them ready to begin serving uh, the people. Well, as is the case, uh, um, when, uh, God's, uh, when God prepares a, a setting and a life for his people, um, I mentioned this last time, uh, it isn't long before they fall into sin. The high points are always followed by low points. You know, they, <laughs> the, the tabernacle is built, the priests are, uh, you know, are, are dressed, they're trained, they're consecrated, they're ordained, uh, the people see a sign from God, a uh, tremendous spiritual high point. Uh, but then that high point, uh, as we will soon see, falls into a low point. Just to give you an idea of this cycle throughout history, uh, it begins with uh, Adam and Eve. God gives Adam and Eve paradise. And what do they do? They disobey and they're, they're, they're removed from paradise. Uh, Cain and Abel are, are living freely and in peace. Uh, until Cain kills Abel, Genesis 4. Uh, God cleanses the earth and he sets Noah and his family to restore it. And what does Noah do after all of that? Noah gets drunk, uh, he's naked in his tent, uh, and uh, we have the uh, problem with his uh, sons. Uh, uh, then the Israelites are miraculously freed from Egyptian slavery. And while Moses is receiving the law directly from God, what, what happens below the mountain, right? The people fall into idolatry and, and, and drag Aaron, the future high priest, into their sin uh, with, with them, Exodus chapter 32. So this, the same cycle repeats itself as the period of preparation is completed. Aaron and his four sons are ordained and they begin their ministry as priests at the tabernacle of God on behalf of God's chosen people. Failure mars their very first efforts at, say, uh, at, uh, at service. And so we read about this failure. There are two failures we're gonna talk about today. The first failure, number one, is with Nadab and Abihu. So let's read uh, chapter 10, if you're following along in your Bibles, uh, verses one to three. It says, now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed incense on it and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, it is what the Lord spoke saying, by those who come near me, I will be treated as holy and before all the people, I will be honored. So Aaron therefore kept silent. Well, I want you to note that less than a year has uh, taken place uh, since the golden calf incident happened and this familiar cycle, you know, uh, is now repeating itself. Uh, you know, less than a year before we had the golden calf uh, incident 
And now we have this particular incident that takes place with uh, the Aaron's two oldest uh, sons. Uh, uh, God delivered them from Egypt, you know, with mighty signs and wonders. God had uh, safely led them to Mount Sinai before bringing them into the promised land. God makes a covenant with them to be their God and they exclusively His people. This was uh, a situation that guaranteed them safety and prosperity in the land that would be theirs. All of this for a people, think about it now, God is giving all of this to a people who lived as slaves, who had no national identity or leadership and were doomed to systematic extinction by a nation who feared and despised them, the Egyptians. I mean, that was the situation of the Israelites a year before this particular event took place. So as God with Moses is preparing the plans for a place, a tabernacle where they can worship him and an acceptable manner to come before the living God who will dwell among them, uh, you know, they're preparing the sacrificial system, as God also prepares the law which will guide and purify their conduct before any of these things can be given to them, they fall into idolatry, which sparks a revolt that leads to the death of 3,000 men. I'm talking about the golden calf incident here. We read further on that Moses intercedes on behalf of the people, effectively turning away God's wrath where God was about to destroy the people and begin again his plan to save mankind, this time using Moses' descendants instead of Abraham's descendants. However, God hears Moses and his pleas on behalf of the people and the cycle turns favorably towards the Israelites once again and we see the signs of this uptick repeat itself. God renews the covenant with the people. He replaces the uh, tablets of the law and, and the building of the tabernacle and pre pre the preparation of the priests for ordination begin in earnest once again as the work to complete this thing is, uh, is actually begun. All of this you know, taking place in the book of uh, Exodus. Now, I, I review these events with you because this cycle is the pattern that continually dominates the history of the Jews throughout the Old Testament. Whether it's material from the Pentateuch, you know, from Genesis to Deuter uh, Deuteronomy, whether it's material from history, the books of history, Joshua to Esther, the books of poetry from Job to Song of Solomon, or the major prophets from Isaiah to, uh, to uh, Daniel, or the minor prophets from Hosea to Malachi. Uh, no matter where you look, this is my point here, no matter where you look in the Bible, in the Old Testament, this cycle follows the very same pattern. The people are in trouble, or they're in disobedience to God, and they're crying out for help. Sometimes there's a, a trouble or a decline leading to eventual destruction, but no one is, uh, is aware or calling out for help, like, uh, like in Noah's time, for example. And then God intervenes somehow. Uh, he sends or he raises up a savior, a person like Moses or Gideon or Esther, or he creates a, a miraculous situation like the great flood, which saves the people or changes the situation eventually for the better. And then the next stage, the people enjoy a period of peace and faithfulness and prosperity for a time. And then someone, a king or a leader or the people as a whole begin to slowly drift back into sin, whether it's immoral behavior like you know, David and Bathsheba, or the curse of idolatry, you know, the Jews, uh, you know, the Jews never abandoned the true God altogether. They, they practice what's called syncretism, where they added worship, the worship of local pagan gods, uh, for example, like Baal, uh, to their practice of Jewish temple worship. They would keep the festivals and they would do the sacrifices and they would go to the temple, but privately they would have 
uh, pagan idols and gods in their homes and they would, they would, uh, they would practice the worship of the local gods along with their worship of uh, the true God. Uh, and usually it was an accommodation to spouses who were not Israelites. That, that was the main problem with the Jews when they went into the promised land. God told them to wipe out the people, otherwise they'd be a stumbling block to them. And in many instances, they didn't do that. And when they didn't do that, they took some of the women uh, to be his wives and eventually these, uh, uh, these mixed marriages uh, created problems whereby the, uh, uh, you know, the men uh, in those families began to worship the gods of, of their wives. And so this usually led to more flagrant idolatrous practices, the lowering of moral standards, the loss of God's favor, blessings and prosperity, which eventually resulted in a, a weak and unholy society, which God would punish. And he'd punish them in different ways, uh, economic ruin or illness, war or dominance by neighboring countries. And then finally, someone would call out to God for help or God would acknowledge the suffering and the dire straits of his people and God in some way would intervene on behalf of his people to save them and to restore them and to start this cycle all over again. Now, the difference between the various types of books in the Old Testament, the Pentateuch as opposed to the history books, uh, as opposed to the books of poetry, the difference between all these books is the way that they told this story about this cycle. Okay, they, they, tell, they all tell the same story about this continual cycle going round and round, but they tell it in different ways. For example, uh, the, 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 the books in the Pentateuch or the history book, they told this story in real time. In other words, as a narrative, chronologically, this happened and that happened and this happened and that happened. And when, you know, they, 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 tell it, they tell the story in that way. The books of poetry, uh, they examined the people and their various experiences and thoughts that they had at different points in the cycle. Sometimes the poems of the, uh, the Psalms uh, were rejoicing in the fact that God was blessing them. Well, that means they were in the, they were in the high, high cycle, you know. And yet other psalms, other poems would be crying out to God for help because of the trouble that they were in. Well, obviously those poems reflected a period in the cycle uh, when it was at its low end, when they were uh, in sin and God was uh, punishing them. In the prophets, in the books of the prophets, the prophets, uh, they tell this story also, but in the prophets, they warned of the danger in heading towards the bottom point of the cycle. They, they spoke against the disobedience and the lack of repentance and the punishment that was to come to the people because they were falling away from God. Interesting thing about the prophets, however, is they always ended their prophecies with the promise of renewal and blessings that the people would eventually come back and, and go back to the top of the cycle, which was of course, faithfulness and obedience to God. So I'm just, this is a, this is a kind of a side note that I'm saying here. This is a, a constant theme, a constant cycle that that you'll see as you read through the entire Old Testament, not just in Exodus or Leviticus, but throughout the Old Testament, excuse me. So in chapter 10 of Leviticus, here uh, the, the writer recounts another quick turn of this deadly cycle. Once again, God had renewed the people after the incident you know, with the golden calf, with new tablets, with the, you know, the building and the consecration of the tabernacle complex itself, as well as selection of Aaron and his four sons as high priest and priests. 
Uh, and then, you know, uh, last lesson, we talked about the, the, uh, the very complex uh, uh, process of consecrating them and, and anointing them and, and sending them into service. All of this being done, uh, you know, uh, returning the people to a high point in their history of their relationship with God. Then we get to chapter 10. Uh, no sooner than at the beginning of their ministry, Aaron's two eldest sons disobey one of God's instructions concerning the offering of incense. And as a consequence, they're immediately put to death by God himself for their disobedience. Now the question is always, you know, when we talk about this, what was their sin exactly? What exactly did they do wrong? Offering the burning of incense in front of the altar of incense located in the holy place before the curtain that separated the holy of holies from the holy place, this was acceptable. This was a normal task of the priests. Now there are various ways that they may have knowingly disobeyed and dishonored God on that day. Several, you know, there's you know, several uh, ideas about what their sin was exactly. First, um, they required burning coals in their fire. Fire pans was just something in which they carried the burning coals and they put the incense on top of them in order to burn the incense. So they required burning coals in their fire pans in order to burn this especially prepared incense. However, the, the only coals permitted would be from the altar of burnt offering, which was in the courtyard, which had been consecrated. And if it had been consecrated, it means it was holy. It had been set apart for that special purpose. The sin is that they may have obtained their fire or their heating element from another source, thus making it unholy or profane in God's eyes. Another uh, aspect, uh, another uh, suggestion as to what the, uh, what the sin was, another theory, is that uh, they perhaps were usurping the authority of the high priest. What I mean by that is that some people speculate that they performed a rite at a time when only the high priest was allowed to enter the holy place, thus spoiling the offering. In other words, they did something that only their father should have done. Another uh, speculation is that they offered unauthorized incense. We know that the incense used for worship in the tabernacle was made from a divine formula that's uh, described in Exodus chapter 30 which was not to be used for anything else but worship. Only this incense, this type of incense, using this formula could be used in the worship uh, at the tabernacle. Some believe that they substituted some other kind of incense to burn. You know, maybe the thought was, ah, incense is incense. You know, we, we don't have enough of the special incense. Let's just get this other stuff and we'll use that. They think that was, the, that was the sin. And yet another theory is that they served while they were intoxicated. In verses eight and nine, uh, God forbids the priests from drinking wine or strong drink while they are on duty so that they will be clear-minded and obey the rules as to what is holy and to what is profane. If you followed the eight or nine lessons that we've done on Leviticus, you'll uh, you know, realize and accept that the work of the priest was very complicated. There were so many procedures to follow and they had to follow it exactly. And so the rule about you know, not drinking while you were uh, performing as a priest, I mean, there are a lot of reasons for this. One of which was you had to be clear-minded to be able to do the work properly. So some conclude that Nadab and Abihu may have been drinking and uh, thus this made their offering unacceptable. Well, you know, uh, which one of these is it? Well, since the sin was called 
strange fire. They offered strange fire. In Hebrew, this English word strange meant unauthorized or foreign or profane. It would follow that the transgression had something to do with the fire used to burn the incense because that's what you know, Moses calls it. They, they were punished for having used strange fire. And so it wasn't taken from the fire of the altar of the burnt offering whose fire was kept burning 24 seven and was considered holy. Only those coals were to be used to heat the special incense. The fact also that they were killed by some type of fire from God also points to the nature of the offense. To help Aaron deal not only with their deaths, but also how their bodies were disposed of, God confirms that their offense was serious in degrading and disrespecting the absolute holiness of God, thus truly meriting their punishment. So we can conclude uh, that their offense had something to do with the fire that they used to make the, uh, the offering. The point, however, is they did something against the procedures, the rules, the instructions that God had given them and had told them to follow um, uh, strictly and not to make any, any changes or substitutions. Now, to help Aaron deal not only with their deaths, as I mentioned before, but also how their bodies were disposed of, they were just taken outside of the tabernacle area. God confirms that their offense was serious, that uh, the, theirs was not just a, a frivolous execution. They deserved uh, what they received. However, uh, Aaron, in remaining silent, he demonstrated his own devotion and respect for God's holiness, despite his own distress. No matter why his sons were killed, they were his sons. And it would be normal for him to feel distressed, to want to say something, to want to intervene or to come to God and appeal to him. Uh, but he didn't. He didn't say anything. He, he chose to uh, remain silent and this was, this was good for him. And it also demonstrated his maturity. And so Moses enlists the help from Aaron's cousins to remove the bodies outside the camp because Aaron and his two remaining sons cannot leave the tabernacle uh, complex under pain of death. That was another rule that they had to uh, know and remember and, and follow. Aaron and his remaining sons were not to mourn and in those days, the mourning was demonstrated by you know, ripping their clothing or uncovering their heads and you know, putting ashes on their heads uh, uh, as a sign of their sorrow. Uh, however, uh, if they did this, it would be seen as questioning God's judgment. The people, uh, the ordinary people could mourn, but as a sign of grief over the sin uh, committed. In other words, God is saying to them, you, you can mourn, but mourn the fact that they, they committed a sin. Don't, don't simply mourn the fact that they died. Mourn the sadness uh, of the fact that they sinned and because of their sin, they were uh, put to death. So we, we get some instructions uh, following the failure of Nadab and Abihu. The Lord responded to this failure of the priests by providing further instructions to help them avoid sinning in the future as they uh, carried out their duties. So uh, the first thing that uh, he gives them is what the priests uh, are forbidden to do. They were not to drink alcohol when on duty since this would impair their judgment and be quite disrespectful to God who they were serving and in whose presence they were ministering. That, that would only make sense, right? You're not going to, being drunk's not a good thing to begin with, but imagine if you're drunk and you're, ser, you know, you're serving in the tabernacle, that's, that's a terrible thing. 
It hadn't been mentioned as a rule, but now God you know, codifies it. No, no use of uh, intoxicants uh, while, serving, uh, while serving the Lord. Then he gives them other instructions, and this time they're instructions on what they are to do. They were to abstain from wine and strong drink while performing their duties so that they would be clear-minded in doing an important complex work which God defines as the following. They had to distinguish between what is holy and unholy on behalf of the people. Holiness was defined based on how close to the Lord a person or action or object was. The closer you came to God who dwelled in the holy of holies, the holier the action was, the holier the objects were. For example, God's people were holy. The tabernacle where he dwelt was holy. The priests devoted to his service, they were holy. The sacrifices and the incense offered before him, it was holy. And everything that came near or specifically devoted to him all of this was considered holy. Priests were to think clearly so that they could determine what was clean and unclean. Cleanness of a person or thing related to a person or thing's ritual condition, which determined if someone or something could participate in worship. If you were unclean because you had touched a dead animal, you, you, you were not in a condition to participate in worship. You had to go through the process of becoming ritually clean before you could go back and participate in worship. Because God was perfectly holy, only those people and objects who were ritually clean could approach or be used before him. If something common, in other words, unholy, in other words, not consecrated by God. For example, a leader of the people who was not a priest entered the holy place, then sin would be the result and punishment the consequence. Someone unholy, not consecrated by God, who drew near to God without permission, sin and punishment were the result. We had examples of this. Nadab and Abihu, for example, they brought an unholy, unclean fire into the holy place and they were punished for it. We have another example of this, not in Leviticus, but in 2 Samuel chapter six. You know, remember the time when the, the Jews were uh, bringing back the Ark of the Covenant that they had been captured in, uh, uh, in, in warfare? and uh, it was being carried on a, on a wagon, being pulled by some, some animals. And everyone, all the Jews that were around the wagon were happy and rejoicing. And at some point, you know, the, the, the animals stumbled and the cart moved, you know, and there was a risk that perhaps the, the ark would fall. And Uzzah reached out with his hand to steady the, the ark. And what happened to Uzzah? He, he, was, he was struck dead for touching it. So the point is that the rules for clean and unclean were quite numerous and complex. And the priests had to know the rules and apply them because a mistake could lead to serious consequences. The priests not only had the responsibility to offer sacrifices on behalf of the people and to carry out this duty correctly, they were also responsible for teaching the people the difference between what was holy and what was profane. I go back to the carrying of the, uh, of the ark on a, on a wagon. You know, somebody decided that was a good idea. We'll, we'll put it on a wagon, we'll, we'll bring it in. You know, we'll carry it into Jerusalem and yet, God had said um, and, specula and, and stipulated that carrying the ark was to be done with the poles. They had to put the, the long poles you know, between the, the, uh, the hooks there and, and uh, on either side of the ark and Levites were supposed to lift it up and carry it on their shoulder. That way there was no chance that anyone would touch it. 
So they thought, well, it's a good thing. We're going to move the ark where it's supposed to be. Let's bring it along. You know, well, how do we do that? Well, let's put it on a, let's put it on a cart. It'll go a lot faster that way. Uh, well, and then when someone touched it, they died and realized God was serious about the rules that he had made for carrying the, uh, for carrying the ark. So all of these tasks required, you know, by the priests, required a sound and clear mind, which was reflected in the command to avoid strong drink while on duty. So after the strange fire incident, God gives the priests further instructions that include first, a command forbidding uh, drinking on duty, which we've talked about, and also instructions about additional duties. And that was to discern and teach the people concerning what was holy, what was unholy, what was clean, what was unclean. He then gives them a third thing. The third thing is instructions about what they were to receive for their work. Moses reassures Aaron and his sons that they would always be compensated and cared for in lieu of the difficult work they performed on behalf of the people. And so he explains, first of all, the grain offerings, right? When they would come and the priest would, you know, offer a, a handful of flour and put that on the altar, but the rest of the grain, the rest of the flour or the cakes or whatever belonged to the priests. So as I said, aside from the handful of fine flowers that they threw on the altar, all the bread, all the cakes, all the other grain offerings, uh, these things were theirs, the priests, to keep and to eat. Since the grain offering was considered most holy, however, it had to be eaten in a holy place. So it was eaten beside the altar. And then there were the peace offerings. Remember, we talked about the five different kinds of offerings. The peace offerings. So the animals sacrificed as peace offerings uh, held back the breast of the animal and the right thigh of the animal for the priest. Since it was not categorized as a most holy sacrifice, it didn't have to be eaten near the altar. A clean place would suffice, which meant that the priest could share this meat with his family at home. Uh, a wave offering is when the priest would lift up the breast or the thigh symbolically offering it to God, but in practice would actually keep for himself, for his personal needs and the needs of his uh, uh, family. He would symbolically offer it to God. That, that's what a wave offering was, symbolically offering it to God. But in practice, God had permitted the priest to keep these portions of the animal for uh, you know, his own needs. He had to feed his, uh, his family. These instructions show that the work of the priest was quite demanding, but God provided assurance that the priests would always be cared for throughout their lives. Now, remember I said there were two failures. The first failure, Nadab and Abihu, everybody kind of knows about that one. The second failure was with Aaron, and it was about an uneaten sin offering in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 16 to 20. So let's read that, the second failure here. It says, um, but Moses searched carefully for the goat of the sin offering and behold, it had been burned up. So he was angry with Aaron's surviving sons, uh, Eleazar and Ithmar saying, why did you not eat the sin offering at the holy place? For it is most holy and he gave it to you to bear away the guilt of the congregation to make atonement for them before the Lord. Behold, since its blood had not been brought inside into the sanctuary, you should certainly have eaten it in the sanctuary just as I commanded. But Aaron spoke to Moses, behold, this very day they presented their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. When things like these happened to me, if I had eaten a sin offering today, would it have been good in the sight of the Lord? When Moses heard that, it seemed good in his sight. All right, so we, we've read you know, the passage. So what was the problem exactly? That's, that's the first thing. What, what was the problem? Well, 
When a sin offering was made for a personal sin, part of the animal was kept back for the priest to eat. We've talked about that before. Moses notes that Aaron's two remaining sons, Eleazar and Ithmar, have offered a sin sacrifice, but they left the entire animal on the altar to burn without taking their portion to eat. This was a serious breach because the atonement and the forgiveness of the sin was only completed once the priest had finished the process by eating his portion of the sacrifice. This meant that the sin of the individual or the congregation of people, if it was offered on their behalf, was not atoned for. Neither was the, forgiven, uh, the forgiveness offered. And a new sin was committed by the priests because of their negligence. So that was the problem. The response. The response is that Aaron acknowledges that they made the sin sacrifice but they felt unworthy to eat the priestly portion, probably due to the fact that they were still feeling the effects of the death of uh, Nadab and Abihu. Perhaps uh, you know, also thinking that uh, they bore some of the responsibility for, for their sin. So his dilemma, Aaron's, uh, not Aaron, but uh, yes, Aaron's dilemma was that if he was not in favor with God, would eating the sacrifice just make things worse? You know, if, if God is mad at me because of what uh, Nadab and Abihu have done, you know, uh, how is he going to feel if I just sit myself down and, and I you know, participate in the sacrifice? You know, parental guilt is nothing new. Uh, parental guilt is nothing new. Aaron felt guilty himself for what his sons, maybe I didn't train them right, maybe I should have, you know, I should, have, uh, I should have known, or maybe I knew that they liked to take a drink and I, I should have warned them for whatever reason. And that affected his judgment concerning you know, his, other, his other work. So the resolution comes. It was Moses and not God that was angry at the breach of protocol. God already knew Aaron's heart and that his failing was due to human weakness and not rebellion and carelessness like Nadab and, and, and Abihu had done. Moses, however, accepts Aaron's explanation, thus relieving him of any sin or guilt for this event. Now, we don't have any further information provided, but from what we know about the sacrificial system, they could resolve this error by offering another sin offering, this time sacrificing one animal for the priest's sin, and then a second animal for the original sin of the people, and complete the process by eating the priest's portion next to the altar. Note that the priest would not eat any portion of the animal offered for his own sin, since he was not permitted to profit in any way from his sin. This animal was completely destroyed. He was able to eat a portion of the animal offered on behalf of someone else's sin. That was the distinction between the two. This brings to an end the information concerning the sacrificial system and the ordination of the Jewish priesthood. In chapter 11, Moses provides another manner of attaining holiness, and that is distinguishing between what is clean and unclean from God's perspective. And we'll start that uh, chapter and that discussion next time. As we close out this section, there are three lessons mentioned in my commentary resource book that I'd like to share before we move on to the next part of Leviticus. Three, three lessons that all of us can use based on what we've learned so far. Lesson number one. Lesson number one is that leaders are fallible. You know, the word leader does not equal perfect. God knows leaders sin because uh, there were sacrifices especially designed for secular leaders, you know, the heads of families and tribes, as well as religious leaders, priests and high priests. This obvious situation made it necessary that God send a perfect leader, a king and a priest, 
to offer a perfect sacrifice, Jesus on the cross, to remove all sin forever. We read about the sin being removed in Acts 22, 16, where Ananias says to Saul, now why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So let us, you know, therefore pray for both our secular and our spiritual leaders, because like us, they are weak, and they also need Jesus' help to lead properly. It's something that I do from time to time. I pray for the leaders of our nation, for example, from the very, uh, very top leader, from the president, all the way down to the mayor of our, of our town. Uh, because in one way or another, these men and these women uh, are responsible for leading our country and they need uh, God's help. Uh, even if they don't realize they need God's help, uh, they need God's help and they need our prayers. And uh, we, need to, we need to remember to pray for leaders. Very important. Another uh, lesson uh, from the material we've covered is this. Obedience is essential for holiness. Yeah, this lesson is a little closer to home. This lesson here really springs from what we've talked about. God shows his love to mankind in many ways. However, he requires obedience as a holy God. The first lie that Satan told was that there were no consequences for disobeying God's law. Isn't that what he said to Eve? Oh, surely you're not going to die. Really? Did he say that? Did he, did he say you were going to die if you dis... Nah, come on. Really? That's over the top. I can't believe that. That was the first lie that Satan told. <laughs> that same lie is promoted, even celebrated today. And like Adam and Eve, or Nadab and Abihu, or Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter five, who lied to the Holy Spirit and who were, who were killed on the spot for doing so. We are, we are constantly reminded that there are always consequences for disobedience. Those who strive to be holy as God is holy, they do so by consciously practicing obedience of God's uh, commands. You want to be holy. You, you say to God, please, Lord, I want to be a holy person, therefore pleasing in your sight. Where do I begin? Step number one, you begin by obeying. Somebody will say, well, you know, obeying what? Well, obeying what's right in front of you. What do you need to obey right now, today? What of God's uh, 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 commands and instructions that you know of that you need to obey? Sometimes before you begin to obey, you have to begin by repenting and, 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 and acknowledging to God that you have been disobedient and, and, and now you want to work on, you want to practice being obedient. Obedience is the, is the work that we do uh, as we grow in, uh, in holiness. And then lesson number three. Lesson number three is that innovation can be dangerous. Now, innovation in the arts or engineering uh, can be quite rewarding, yielding uh, newer and better and more efficient and, and pleasurable re results, yes. It's part of God's command to multiply and to subdue the creation. God wants us to innovate in this area of life. But when it comes to worship, however, the opposite is what he wants. He wants us to stick to the instructions that he has given us. Human beings innovate in worship to please themselves, not God. God provided in the Old Testament exactly what he would accept as worship and has also done the very same thing in the New Testament. The task 
is to maintain our obedience to his word concerning worship from generation to generation. It never changes. And so let's remember that innovation can be dangerous, especially when we begin innovating with God's instructions concerning worship. Okay, well, that's our lesson for uh, this time. I'll give you a, a little bit of an assignment here. I want you to read uh, chapters 11 to 15 in Leviticus. We're winding down. We have several lessons left and we have lots to cover. So I'm depending on you to, uh, to read ahead so that you're familiar with the material as I explain it, you know, uh, as we go through sections rather quickly, I'll do my best to, uh, you know, dig down and, and get to the root of, of each section, but I count on you to be reading the material and to be familiar about the things that I'm talking about as we go through this, uh, uh, this book. So that's it for today. God bless you. Thank you for your attention. Don't forget to pray for our leaders. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.